Hello and welcome to Yashoda Hospital's online segment, The Health Talk Session. Cancer is not a single disease, but it is a collection of diseases. It is complex and does not give up readily its secrets. Despite the challenges the cancer poses, the clinicians continue to hone the way in which it is diagnosed and treated. Well, in today's episode, let's discuss about latest advancements in the field of medical oncology. I'm Dr. Lakshmi and let's welcome Dr. G. Vamsi Krishna Reddy, Consultant Medical Oncologist from Yashoda Hospitals, Malakpet. Welcome, Doctor. Hello, I'm Dr. Vamsi Krishna Reddy. I'm Medical Oncologist at uh, Yashoda Hospitals. So, Doctor, what is the most common type of cancer in our country and is there any significant change over the past few decades as far as numbers are concerned? For the last uh, decade or so, what we have seen is definitely there is a shift in the number of cases we see, the cases of uh, cancer are definitely increasing by the day and the number of cancer age patients where we see, we are seeing more in younger patients. So that's one spectrum which we are seeing in the last couple of decades which we have seen. What are the types of cancer which we see commonly in men and women? It's almost the same what we are seeing in the last decade. The head and neck cancers in men are very common. Head and neck cancers include like the tongue cancer, the oral cavity cancer, the throat cancer and the esophageous cancer. These are mostly tobacco related in men. And in smokers we see uh, the lung cancer which is quite common in our country. So lung and uh, head and neck cancers contribute to a significant number of cancers. So other than these two cancers, colon cancer and prostate cancer are other common cancers which we see in men. In women, we see breast cancer, ovarian and cervical cancer which contribute to approximately 50 to 60 percent of the patients. So these are the common cancers in women. So the patients where we see, again it depends, it's a bias where we see because the patients we see in our hospital might be different from what is reported. But with our population based registry what we have seen is these are the common cancers, the head and neck cancers in men and the breast and uh, ovary cancer and cervical cancer in women are the commonest cancers in our country. So doctor, you've just mentioned that cancer is being diagnosed more among the younger population. So what do you think the cause for this could be? Is it always genetic or what are the other contributing factors? The cause of uh, these cancers probably is more uh, because of the advances in the medical field where we are picking up more cases because earlier what we were thinking as undiagnosed or due to TB are now being assigned to the oncology thing. Uh, that is probably one reason which I will be seeing because mainly because of the access to the medical facilities. The second thing, the genetic thing, I think probably it's contributing only to around 10% of the total patients. So majority of the cancers we don't have a known cause which is attributed. So only in head and neck cancers we have a risk factor which is tobacco but other than that we don't know why it is happening. And people do claim it to the pollution, indoor or outdoor pollutions which we see and the food contamination but there is nothing to uh, prove that this is because of that but definitely there is some factor which is still unknown which contributes to 90% of the cancer cases. So doctor what are the symptoms or red flag signs that one should be aware of as far as cancer is concerned? So for most of the cancers it's very important to pick up any unusual thing happening in your body and report it to the doctor. So usually we put it as any symptom which is persisting for at least 7 to 14 days which is not resolving should be a red flag sign. Any symptom whatever the patient feels uncomfortable with because ignoring the symptoms usually pushes them into a stage where most of the times we pick up at an advanced stage. So like speaking about the common cancers which we said we need to look for symptoms like if it were a breast cancer we usually need to look for any lump or swelling in the breast or any red color discharge from the nipple. These are the common symptoms of breast cancer. Ovary cancer usually does not present early. So we see symptoms like abdomen bloating, abdomen distension, rarely pain abdomen. For the cervical cancer, we see usually patients presenting with uh, bleeding or a white discharge per vagina and that's a common symptom of cervical cancer. For the head and neck cancer, we see like a non-healing ulcer or a sore in the mouth which usually does not heal and it increases. That's a symptom with head and neck cancer. Uh, for throat cancers, we see that patient will not be able to swallow. Usually they'll have difficulty in swallowing food. So any symptom which patient is unable to 
explain why it is happening should be again reviewed by a doctor and he should see whether it is a normal symptom or something a warning sign or a caution sign for the patient. So as we all know that if cancer is picked up in its initial stages, it is more curable and easily treatable. So what are the different screening tools we utilize to diagnose cancer? For picking up cancers early or what we call as a screening methodology, we need to have patients who have high incidence of cancer. So for that reason, uh, we have only three cancers for which screening is approved in our country. For breast cancer, we usually do screening with a mammogram. So mammogram is a type of x-ray where we usually do the x-ray of the breast and it's usually started at the age of 40 years and then later it has to be followed every year or two yearly based on the baseline mammogram. For cervical cancers, we have something called as a pap smear which we usually we are combining with the liquid based cytology test and we usually do the uh, pap smear every two to three years from the age of 21 years or onset of the sexual activity. For colon cancers, we have colonoscopy. So where we usually visualize the entire colon with the colonoscope and it's usually started at the age of 50 years and we do it every 10 years from there onwards. So we have only three cancers which can be picked up by screening for the general population. In men for prostate cancer, at time we screen with the PSA, but again that's with the consent and we need to explain them both the risk and benefit. The other cancer where we usually are offering screening is lung cancer. If some person is a heavy smoker who has packed 20 pack years or more, we can do a CT scan of the chest to see uh, where any early lesion can be picked up. So again, it's an annual CT scan for screening the lung cancer. So if we are doing for the regular general population, it's for the woman with a mammogram for breast cancer, pap smear for the cervical cancer, colonoscopy for both men and women at the age 50 and above. Only for smokers we do do with a CT chest for lung cancer. So these are the screening tests which are approved. So doctor, do you think there is adequate awareness as far as cancer is concerned among general population? I mean, do they just walk in and get themselves screened for despite having no symptoms as what we have seen in the past few decades? Yes, I think uh, compared to the past, what I am seeing nowadays is we are getting a good number of patients who come and ask whether I am having cancer or not. Do I need to get any test? like whether I need to get a mammogram. So these uh, tests are quite prevalent nowadays. They are coming and asking for this test and getting them done. So these are a good positive sign in our patients because that's because of this education this series or whatever the doctors are doing these programs, it's being percolated down the society. And uh, more and more of the screening tests, we are picking up cancers in an early stage and that's leading to better survival and cure rates. So doctor, how is cancer diagnosed and what are the tests we run in general? So most of the times cancer is diagnosed by looking at the cells. So whichever site the cancer is suspected, we take a biopsy from that site. We see it under the microscope and diagnose what type of cancer it is. So most of the times biopsy is the test which needs to be done to confirm the diagnosis of cancer. So talking about the latest advancements in the field of oncology, what is the role of PET-CT in the field of oncology? So PET-CT for us most of the times we use it for staging the cancer. PET scan or what we simply call as a PET-CT scan. So it's a scan where we usually give an injection and uh, once it is metabolized by the cancer cells, we take a photo or what we call a gamma camera image capture and we usually correlate with the CT images and see where all the cancer is in the body. So PET CT helps us in knowing where else the cancer is spread other than the sites we know. So we do it for the whole body, so right from the head which includes the brain to the foot. So that's all areas we usually screen it and see whether it has spread to any other body part or not. So it's a very important test to stage uh, the cancer because if it's an advanced stage, if you are missing that the cancer has spread outside, we can avoid unnecessary treatment for the patient like surgery or so. Because, uh, and also it will help us in knowing whether which site needs to be biopsied. At times it's also helping us in knowing what is the site probable site of cancer. So PET scan has tremendously changed the way in which we treat cancers and it has become an integral part in the treatment of cancer patients. So what are the most common cancers that are treated with PET-CT, doctor? So 
PET scan usually is helping us in staging so that was in the past so nowadays even we are using this PET CT therapy or which we are calling as PRRT so what we do is once we get a PET scan and we see the parts of the body which are affected by this cancer where there is concentration of this radioactive tracer we usually give a high dose of the same radioactive tracer and kill those cancer cells or we call it as a radionuclide therapy this therapy was commonly used in the past for thyroid cancer nowadays we are using this for neuroendocrine tumors and also in prostate cancer so PRRT is a newer form of therapy where we are using our nuclear medicine department to help us in treating uh, cancer patients especially those affected with prostate and neuroendocrine tumors so doctor I'm sure that you would agree with me that the word cancer is still associated with a lot of stigma in our country despite medical field making a lot of advancements so what message you would like to give to all the patients cancer survivors and caregivers too the general population per se don't be afraid by the diagnosis of cancer so even today what we see is patients do trust their relatives friends or known persons before they go ahead with the treatment so do not spread false information so radiation does not mean giving electric shocks or chemotherapy does not cause pain so most of the times it's the cancer which causes problems and unfortunately because of this rumors those patients who are in a curable state they we are losing their precious lives because they do not take treatment just for the fear that the treatment is painful so there are few cancers where we will not be able to help there are few cancers where we will be able to help so please have an open discussion with your doctor and trust the words of your doctor than relying on the rumors and avoiding a chance of cure so go ahead have a healthy lifestyle get yourself screened and if you have any symptoms please consult your doctor let him check your body and say whether you are good or bad if there is any problem please do take care of your health and if they are, unfortunately if someone is diagnosed with cancer what we need to show them is the courage to go and fight it out so thank you doctor it was wonderful talking to you thank you so this brings us to the end of this episode and do join us for the next week as well thank you and stay safe